All right, so we're back here with the third lesson. We're still dealing with the agency definition, so let's go back over here to where we were and let's finish up. Uh, we had talked about your cold portion of the cold AC and the care, the obedience, the loyalty, the disclosure. Now I wanna talk about something, the last two, and I want you to understand that accounting and confidentiality are the last two of these six, all right? So during the time frame of agency, when you create agency, you have these six responsibilities right here. So during agency, you have all six of those. Your agency starts when you guys initiate either the contract to sign it or you start working with them, all right? I would prefer that even with buyers, you use a buyer's agency agreement because then it becomes express agency. If you don't, it's implied agency, but that's still agency and you still owe these loyal, uh, responsibilities to them. Now, we can terminate agency in several different ways. We've started it, how do we end it? We can end agency by a couple of different ways. The first one is we can complete the deal. We close on the house, everything's fine. Death of either party. That is the death of me or the client, not you, all right? Because remember, it's my client, my deal, not yours. If something happens to you, I simply just move that deal to another agent inside of my agency because it's not your death that terminates the listing or agency. It is my death, okay? Destruction of the property, if it burns to the ground, earthquake, something like that, that would terminate the listing and the agency. Mutual agreement, you guys can actually agree to terminate a listing. If you both agree, it's okay. Dude, I hate the shirt you're wearing. Man, your hair looks shitty. Okay, let's terminate the uh, listing agreement. Fine by me. Um, act of law, like a bankruptcy, divorce. Those could trigger it, all right? Uh, what do we got? Uh, completion, death, destruction, Mutual agreement, act of law. There is a breach of contract. One party or the other fails to do what they're supposed to do. Client's not letting you show the property. You're wasting a bunch of marketing time, effort, and money, and they're not letting you in. Theoretically, they're breaching their obligation to allow the property to be shown. They have breached the listing agreement. And then the last one is this thing called expiration. Your listing agreement has to expire, all right? It cannot be a perpetual listing agreement. There is no such thing as it ending and then rolling over to a new one and then rolling over to a new one and then rolling over to a new one. Now, here's something that's kind of interesting I just dealt with the other day. Let me move this off the screen for a second. Somebody called me and said, hey, do we amend a listing agreement if we want to extend the time? or do we write a new one? So the question is, do we amend an old one or do we write a new one? Now, I'm going to give you my advice as 20 years in the business, but remember, I am not a practicing attorney, but I did sleep in a Holiday Inn. So listen, here's what my attorney has told me. If you go out and you want to extend the listing date and the contract is still in place, you may in fact amend the date. So if it expires here on the 20th and you go out on the 19th and say, I want to extend this date for six more months out, you are technically still under contract. You can amend that with an amendment to change the date way out here to December the 25th if you wanted to do that. Now, 
if it expires on the 20th and you go out on the 21st, you cannot amend a contract that is expired. So in essence, it ended right here. You cannot change that contract because it expired already. You would in fact have to write a new listing that goes until December the 25th. So that has been my <coughs> go-to stance since my attorney told me that. Whether to use the amendment or write a new one kind of depends on when do you go out and get it changed. If, you, if it was expired, you got to write a new one. If you got there before the contract expired the day before or the day of because it expires at midnight, obviously, you could amend that contract. So keep that in mind. That's just the general term that... Uh, terminology that we use as to which one to use, either write a new one or an amendment. Now, theoretically, you could always write a, a new one and you're never going to be wrong if that's the case. If you don't want to write the whole six page, you just want to write a couple lines in an amendment, make sure you go out the day before or the week before and amend the contract that you have got. All right, so let's go back to this. So that would be the seventh way that the agency would terminate. You complete it, a death, destruction, mutual agreement, act of law, a breach, or it expires. Okay? Now, after agency terminates, after agency terminates, you keep these in perpetuity, which means forever. You are not allowed to tell a former client, sorry, I can't help you with your accounting because you're not my client anymore. No, accounting you keep forever. Your client calls and says, hey, look, I was looking over the closing statement last week and I noticed the earnest money was not accounted for on this settlement statement. Can you help me out? Yes, I can. I will work on that and get back with you. The other part is you are not allowed to use any information your client gave you in confidentiality. Hey, my wife's leaving me, my daughter's pregnant, my cat's on heroin, I want to sell this house. You cannot later go out and use that information to find a buyer and go, hey dude, let's go buy this house because I know that dude's wife's leaving him, his daughter's pregnant, his cat's a user, all of that stuff because that was given to you in confidentiality. Now, if whatever he told you in confidentiality can actually be now as public knowledge, like the divorce is final, that would be a situation of that piece of knowledge is not confidential anymore. Hey, the divorce decree was went through, it was in the paper, everybody knows it. I now do not have to hide the fact that he could be motivated because he just got divorced. All right? We understand that because it was public knowledge that was given to him. Cool. <clears throat> now, there is this thing called the disclosure of agency. This comes from a lawsuit several years ago where a seller sold a house with a listing agent and when it came to closing, the seller said, I'm not paying this guy. I didn't, I didn't know what an agent was. He didn't understand. At least he claimed not to understand what agency was. So we have this thing called the written office policy. The written office policy. In essence, this explains agency to your client. The good example that I give or the story I like to tell is <clears throat> my education, formal education from both Texas A&M and then grad school at Purdue is in nuclear engineering. We could talk all day about a positive power coefficient. Unfortunately, I would have to explain to you what a positive power coefficient is when dealing with uh, nuclear reactors before we could even discuss it. The same thing is true here. You cannot really talk about agency with a potential seller or buyer until you describe what agency is. 
That document called the written office policy is required under the Indiana Real Estate Commission's administrative laws that say you must disclose agency to your client or soon to be client prior to them actually becoming a client. So literally, a guy that wants to sell his house before he can sign the listing agreement really needs to sign your office policy because you have to explain to him, hey, here's what an agent is, here's what it means, here's what I will do for you, here's what we will do with single agency, here's what we're going to do with limited agency. Do you understand that? And they say, oh, great, sign this. Now let's sign a listing agreement because I had to explain to you first what agency was, then we can talk about me becoming your agent, okay? Now, when it comes to agencies, there are, or agents rather, there are three different versions that you can deal with. The first one's called a universal agent. The best example for a universal agent is a power of attorney. A power of attorney can do anything that person can do. They can enter into contracts, they can sell real estate, they can buy real estate, they can do the banking, all of that in the name of whoever they have the power of attorney for. All right? <clears throat> I am a power of attorney for my mother. I am allowed to sign my mother's name should she need that. That is called a universal agent. The next level down, so to speak, is this thing called a general agent. A general agent is typically granted several different powers, but typically only in one area of a person's life. The best example here is a property manager. A property manager may enter into a lawn care contract. They may screen a tenant. They may pay their investment client's bills like the mortgage payment or the electrical payment. They may hire maintenance men. All of this only for that one property that they have been granted general agency. The third type and typically the lower one of the three is called a special agent. A special agent, good example, is you and I, is a realtor. We are granted one task in one area of a person's life. Like, I will market your property for sale. That's all I do. Or if you're on the other side of the table, I will help you buy a property. All right? You do not get involved in mowing your tenant's lawn, or not tenant, misspoke, mowing your client's lawn. You don't hire the lawn care for them. That would be something that would be granted to a general agent. All you do is market the property for sale. Now, if you find a buyer through your marketing efforts, you may in fact do a second activity, but technically you're not doing it for that listing or that seller. I had a good friend of mine, I listed his property several years ago and Brent and I have been friends for almost 50 years. All right, and I know I can get away with this because he was a buddy of mine. So here's what happened. He called me and he said, hey, Raymond, I want you to list my property. And I said, okay, great, I'll list your property. And we talked about all of the things that we were going to do to list his property. All of the things we were going to do. Then he asked me, he said, so what are you gonna do with a buyer? <laughs> and I looked at him and said, absolutely nothing. He went, what? Aren't you going to find a buyer? I'm like, no, that's not what a listing agent does. A listing agent markets the property for sale. He's like, but, but you got to sign in the yard. Why does someone calls you? Oh, well, if someone calls me. I will certainly show the house. And he's like, okay. I said, but I won't be your agent at that time. I will actually be their agent. And he's like, what? I'm like, trust me. I know what I'm doing. I'm a professional. All right. So think about that. A listing agent doesn't bring buyers to the table. If they do, they're not doing it as a listing agent. They're doing it as the agent for the buyer. So 
the one act I do as a special agent for my seller is to list the property for sale. Now, in my listing efforts, if I run across a potential buyer that wants to see it, I will then work for them. And we are going to talk about that here in just a minute. But literally, I will be working as their agent, not the seller's, okay? So when you work for one client or the other, it is called single agency. Now, one of the things I want to go over, and I told you earlier that I actually number my pet peeves, and this is probably number one pet peeve in the real estate world, all right? It fluctuates back and forth with the, the second one, and that's the word quick claim versus people go, it's a quick claim. It's not quick claim. It's a quit claim, all right? So this is the one that fluctuates with this. If you work with the seller, you are in fact the listing agent, right? Got it so far. Now, you know where I'm going with this because you've been in the business almost two years, so you should understand this. If you work with the buyer, you are called what? I'll give you a minute to think about it. You are called the selling agent. Please, please, please do not ever call me and tell me you're the selling agent and your seller wants to do the blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whoa, time out. If you're working with the seller, you're the listing agent. The selling agent works with the buyers. Think about it like this. The seller, your job is to list the property for sale. Therefore, you are the listing agent. If you are working with a buyer and you bring that buyer into my listing, it is entirely your job to sell them on the attributes of this property. Hey, Mr. Buyer, look, it's four bedrooms. You told me you wanted a bedroom for every child. Here it is. There's a huge uh, living room. You said you wanted a place to put their piano. Is there any reason we should not be making an offer on this house today? You are the one selling the house to your client. Therefore, you are the selling agent. Please remember that. If you look at the top of the purchase agreement, it even says that. Listing agent, selling agent. There is no buying agent. There's a buyer's agency agreement, but it's a listing agent and a buyer's and a selling agent. All right? Those, if you work with one of them, are single agency. You are working with just one person. Now, in the property management world, you can be working with the landlord or the tenant, same concept, single agency. I'm either the tenant rep or the landlord rep if you're doing leasing or property management, things like that. So that's single agency. Now, there is another form of agency where you work with both the buyer and the seller at the same time on the same deal. That is the key part in this. It is working with the buyer and the seller on the same deal. Following in line with the word single, which is what we talked about, you can now call this dual agency. But I'm here to tell you right now, in Indiana, it's called limited agency. Don't use the word dual. Using the word dual is like using the word ain't. Dude, I know what you mean. I'll just think you're an idiot because you're not speaking the proper terminology, all right? You are a limited agent if you work with both the buyer and the seller on the same deal. You can be single agency. You can work with a buyer and a seller on two different deals. You may have one client that is both. You may be the listing agent on one of his deals, and then he's going to buy a house over here, so you're the selling agent for the same client. It is not limited agency. Limited agency is working with the buyer and the seller on the same deal or the property, if you want to look at it that way. That would be limited agency. Indiana still allows limited agency, but it must be disclosed in writing 
in advance. Now, I have this disagreement all the time with a lot of other agents, so let me tell you my side of the story. There are people that go, well, I'll show the house, but I'll get the form signed when I write the offer. Dude, do you understand what the offer is or what the signature is? It is to remind the seller, hey, you know this is my guy. Is it okay? If you wait until you sign the limited agency when you write the offer, you could have potentially already violated some ethical rule insofar as you may have disclosed something during the showing that you were not allowed to disclose. Like, hey, there's a picture of the seller on his last vacation because he hit the lottery. Your buyer's going to go, dude, he may not need the money then. So you have to get this listed, this limited agency agreement signed in writing prior to doing any agency activities, which includes the showing. And I understand that that can be a big pain in the bazoo for you guys because your buyer is going to call you or a buyer is going to call you and say, dude, I'm standing in front of the house right now. Can you come show it to me? And you're like, sure, I'll be right there. Before you walk him in the house, you better go knock on the door and go, hey, Mr. Seller. It's me, your agent, but I've got a buyer that's wanting to see the house. Is that okay with you? And the seller says, sure. You say, okay, great. Sign this form that says it's okay. And I will go back out to the guy standing in the front yard and say, hey, Mr. Buyer, I know you just called me off that sign. So, you know, I've got the listing, but you understand I've got the listing. And he says, yes. Is that okay? Yes then I need you to sign this form so that you do not get caught up in this undisclosed dual agency. That is probably one of the number one violations that the Real Estate Commission sees as violation of license law. The undisclosed dual agency of an agent working for both a buyer and a seller and he didn't get their permission in advance. All right. Get their permission in advance of any agency activity, which includes showing them the property. Don't wait until, well, I'm going to wait till he to see if he wants to write an offer. Then I'll get it. You've already violated the rule. All right. Um, in-house agency. In-house agency is where me as a managing broker might have one of my agents as the listing agent. And then I've got a separate agent is working as the selling agent. All right. Because I can separate them out of the office, meaning their consciousness, they aren't going to be knowing everything. That is called in-house agency. That is not or does not trigger the limited agency disclosure. It is called in-house agency. And a lot of times, uh, well, going back, I forgot my jokes already. See, I got so flustered, I forgot some of my jokes. In the in-house agency, that is okay and is not required. That is completely different than outhouse agency because that would just be shitty. There's one of them, all right? Limited agency is where you work on the same deal. A lot of agents love limited agency because they call it a me, me deal. A lot of times you hear it called a me, me deal because I'm getting both sides. If you do that on a really small house, that's called a mini me. But I actually had to go back just to pick that joke up because I thought it was hilarious. There is a thing called non-agency. There has been some scuttlebutt going on with the Indiana Association of Realtors and their legal department. And I have had talks about this whole thing called a non-agency. And if you think back to when we talked about the Indiana Bar Association going after the Realtors and there was a lawsuit in 63 where the Indiana Supreme Court said it was okay for us to fill in blanks. Cool. Cool. Because there's agency there. That's what allows us to fill those blanks in and work with that document. The new mindset is if you have a non-agent or a non-client and they have actually signed a form saying they are not your client, you cannot work as 
any kind of agent for them, nor can you explain the documents because that, my friend, is the unauthorized practice of law. So if they are not your agent, you cannot explain the purchase agreement because it is a legal document that requires an attorney to explain it. If you have agency, then we are covered under that Indiana Association, Indiana Bar Association legal battle that was determined way back years ago. Okay? We have gone way past our time frame on this uh, slide, but there was a lot of information in this for you together. I hope you collected some of it, wrote it down in your workbook, and stored it away in your memory. We are going to finish up here real quickly by talking about some of the lesson skills that you need to understand. If I were you, go out and Google legal contracts so that you can get an understanding and read a bunch of court cases and read a bunch of real estate court cases and see where agents were sued or how they defended themselves successfully. I would suggest you hire an attorney or at least take one to lunch or coffee and get their perspective on real estate lawsuits. How many do you see? How many are successful? Do they typically lean towards the buyer in this? Like they lean towards tenants in uh, landlord court, very pro tenant this state. So you might wanna know that. Ask him a bunch of questions. You might even visit a small claims court to see if there's any real estate cases going on that you can go, holy crap, I've got one very similar to that, and I just heard the judge give the outcome, we could be in trouble. Or conversely, you could say, we might be in, on the winning side of this based on what that judge just told me. One of the other things I'd like for you to do is download the NAR's Code of Ethics. Read the Code of Ethics and understand your ethical responsibilities that are required of you as a licensed agent. Now, there are 17 articles. The one problem with the internet that I see is there is a lot of old documents that no one ever takes down. So make sure you've got the newest version of the Code of Ethics. And the best way to do that is to go to the NAR itself and download the current version of the Code of Ethics so that you understand it. What I want you to uh, understand here as the summary is a contract is a legally binding agreement between two parties that have voluntarily entered it. Either party could be subject to a lawsuit if they breach the contract, and that could go into civil court or a small claims court, depending on if it's a landlord issue or something like that. Both parties have to have the capacity to contract. Got to be of sufficient mental capacity and must be of legal age. And they have to offer up something of value. One is offering up the real property. The other is offering up money. You, as an agent, can file charges against another agent if you need to. I would remind you to probably seek out uh, a solution before that happens. The public can also file charges against you with the local board. If there was a client that thought you did something wrong, the client can file charges at the board against you as well. So keep that in mind. All right, we're going to take a break. We've been here a lot longer than I wanted to, a lot longer than you wanted to, but we're going to come back here in just a few minutes with lesson four.